Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm glad that you can join us again on our series this morning in our Sunday School Hour on Sunday mornings here um, about questionable things. Uh, let me read the passage to you this morning, and we'll give you kind of uh, a little quick review on the study. Um, we've already covered uh, two things. And uh, so anyway, let me read, first of all, the first verse, and then I'll skip down to verses 10 through 12 to begin our uh, next portion of this. And these are basically um, areas where, uh, you know, that are not very clear in the Scripture. Um, there, uh, as the Bible says in verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Doubtful disputations, or as I've said for the series title, questionable things, things that are not very clear in Scripture, so therefore, we need to live by Bible principle. The Bible is full of principles to live by. We don't need a thou shalt and thou shalt not list if we live by Bible principle. So where you can't find an exact scripture that will identify a certain uh, action, activity, choice, decision, you need to live by Bible principle. And as I've said in the previous weeks, uh, when it comes down to this uh, aspect um, of these things that are doubtful disputations or questionable things, um, if any one of these six things uh, that we're, we're going to complete uh, when we finish this study, if any one of those, if the answer to the question is no, then therefore you need to stop. You need to stop. And uh, you need to wait on God. You need to pray and just uh, wait till the right timing. Maybe it's not the right timing, um, or maybe it's just not the Lord's will. Amen? So anyway, let me pray, and then, like I said, we'll quickly review, and then we'll get into the third uh, question to ask yourself when you're dealing with something you're not too sure about. And uh, so let me read, uh, let me pray here, and we'll, we'll read some more. Father, again, thank you for your word. Bless our time together this morning. Lord God, and Father, bless the Children's Sunday School, uh, Lord God, uh, this morning. And uh, Father, again, just uh, uh, strengthen, uh, uh, Lord God, believers. Encourage and strengthen them in spite of some of the difficulties that are taking place uh, all over North America and in the world. And uh, so, Father, we just pray this morning you would meet each and every need, speak to hearts, pray for those who might not know you, this morning, that they would come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, so, Father, again, uh, thank you again for another opportunity. Thank you for freedom and liberty, Lord God, to be able to preach, uh, to teach, uh, to get the gospel out. And, uh, Father, talk to people, oh Lord God. So now bless our time this morning. May we bring honor and glory to you, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first question that we had was contained in verses 1 through 5. And if you want a simple outline of this uh, study, please, by all means, uh, contact me. You'll see some links there in the description box that you can just contact me. And I'll, I could send you this um, uh, outline for this study. Uh, the first thing is, are you fully convinced? Are you fully convinced? Um, you know, it's important this morning the Bible says over in the end of verse 5, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. In other words, if you're not fully persuaded, if you're less than 99.99999, uh, 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 listen, if you are anything less than 100%, stop. You got to stop. Stop pursuing. Wait on God. Amen? Um Fully persuaded, fully persuaded. And again, as we mentioned before, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, in Paul, the Pauline epistles there, are dealing with matters concerning uh, foods. And uh, so the context of this is, if, if you read through the chapter here, is about foods and questionable whether you should eat meats or not and so forth. And we've already mentioned that in the previous studies. We will not uh, discuss that again this morning. Um, so, and that's the first one. Are you fully persuaded or are you fully convinced? Amen? Are you fully convinced that this thing that you're dealing with, uh, that you're going to take the right direction in it? 
Number two, number two, uh, we covered this last week. Um, are you doing this unto the Lord? As we mentioned last week, as we were getting ready to close at the end of the message last week, the Bible says that you are not your own. You are not your own. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that um, in verse 7 of chapter 14 of Romans, for none of us liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. So whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. You're saved this morning. You are the Lord's. You have no right to make any choices and decisions in your life as a believer without, number one, considering God, considering the Lord, checking in with the Lord this morning. We have no right. We are not our own. As I mentioned, which we didn't get into detail, of course, was the 1 Corinthians 7 matter. If you study that, it's all about marriage and so forth. And in that, he talks about how that when you get married, you're not your own. So you're doubly not your own. When you get saved, you're not your own. When you get married, you're not your own. You got to consider your spouse before you make decisions and choices. I know some of the men out there might not like that, but that's what the Bible teaches. You're supposed to render due benevolence. Those are some matters that uh, some men really get stuck on themselves and a little bit on their high horses when it comes to authority. That's not the kind of leadership the Bible talks about. You need to consider one another. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 5.21, the Bible says, submitting yourselves one to another. Don't forget, before you got married, your wife, hopefully, of course, was your sister or brother. Your wife was your sister in Christ. Your husband was your brother in Christ. Amen? Let's not forget that. And uh, so, so are you doing, can you do this unto the Lord? Would God be pleased with this by you doing it? Amen? As a matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 4, and I think it's... Uh, let me check in here really quick. Revelation chapter 4. Give you the right passages. Uh, in uh, verses 9, 10, and 11, the Bible, especially verse 11, he says, Thou hast created all things for thy pleasure they are and were created. So God created you for his good pleasure. Now, whether you get enjoyment out of pleasing God, that's another thing. Obviously, if your heart's right with God, you will enjoy pleasing God. And you'll enjoy richly all things, as Paul wrote to Timothy. Amen? So the goal is to please God. What, what pleases God? What, what, what pleases God this morning? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your talents? What are you doing with your treasures this morning? Is it pleasing to God? Would God accept it? If you're an Old Testament saint, would he accept that? Would he accept that? Or would it be like the priests over in Malachi where they were offering lambs that were blind, maim, and halt? They were expecting God to receive the seconds. Isn't that sad how Christians sometimes think about things? That's no, listen, you can't offer that. God says, give me your best. Give me the best of your time, talents, and treasures. Don't give me the last. Don't give me what's left over. Give me the best that you have. Are you giving God the best that you have? Amen. God deserves it. If you're saved this morning, he, he deserves it. He deserves everything. He, does, he deserves a lot more than what we're giving him, I'll tell you that. And it has nothing to do with paying for your salvation because you're saved by grace through faith. We know that. But can you show your appreciation to God for what he's done? Just like you should show your appreciation to other people when they've been so good to you. Amen? Or do we just take it for granted we have a spirit of entitlement? We're entitled to things. Amen? Well, I'll tell you, it's by the grace and mercy of God. Amen? So, number three, and let's get into this. We'll look into this one here in the next half hour here. We'll look at these, and we'll look at some examples in the Bible. Uh, number three, verses 10 through 12. Why dost thou uh, judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow uh, to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's important to note. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in uh, his brother's way. Um, so the question is this, 
how will it stand at the judgment seat of Christ? So let me give you a little bit of background for those who may not be all that understanding or maybe knowledgeable in this matter. Uh, there's a, a bunch of judgments throughout the Bible. But let's, let's, let's just think of, of a couple of them, two of them. Um, the first one is what's called the Great White Throne Judgment. As if you've been with us on our Wednesday night study, we're talking about the difference in the first aspect of the Lord's return, uh, which is called the rapture in the, in, uh, the beginning of, prior to the Great Tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, Jeremiah's, or Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And then the other part is the Revelation, where people all over the earth will see him. Okay? So the... The great white throne judgment will happen way later on, and that is at the end of the millennial kingdom, thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. And um, the Bible tells us that those who stand before God on that day, you know, we're all guilty. Everyone's guilty. But that there is reserved mainly for those who are, uh, are lost. Amen? If you're saved right now, thank God you will not be a subject at that judgment. You will not be a subject at that judgment. But thank God that's been reserved for those who are lost. For those who are saved, we have another judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. Some call it the Bema seat. And the purpose behind this judgment is not so that for salvation, because that's already been predetermined. On this earth, before you die, you're either going to, when you take that last breath, depending on if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior or not, you're either going to go to heaven or hell. There's only two places. It's very basic, very simple. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So are you saved? Do you know Christ? Are you trusted in your baptism, church membership, good works? If you are, you're lost. For by grace are you saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved faith. And that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any men should boast. The Bible says, for all of sin it comes short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can't work for it. It's by grace, through faith. Amen? So, if your faith and trust is in anything but the finished work of Christ on the cross, you're lost. I don't care how good you are. It's nice to have good people around. It's great in the world to have people who are kind and, and loving and caring and compassionate. That's all important. That makes life very, very nice down here. But that will not save your soul. What will save your soul is what you've done with Jesus Christ. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Have you believed on Christ? If you have, the Bible says you have eternal life. You don't have temporal life. You, don't, you are born again, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, John chapter 3. So you need to be saved in order to be a participant at the judgment seat of Christ. And all it is, it's a simple matter of rewards. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll look at some of that this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So, you know, uh, when we look at it, we, when, when we look at or trying to make a decision as to, um, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, should we decide to take action on this matter? Should we just wait? Um, or is it a no? You know, it's just like prayer. Amen? Yes, no, wait. That's what the whole point behind this series of, of messages on, um, you know, doubtful disputations or questionable things. You got to know, and you need to get some direction from God, and what better place to get direction from God, number one, through the Word, number two, through prayer. Amen? So it's important. By the way, God will never, ever contradict His own Word. I, I hear this every so, every so often. People are making statements and saying that, you know, it's God's will for me to do something. And what they just said was clearly identified in the Scripture. It's not even a doubtful disputation. It's clearly identified, and they're going against the Word of God. And the problem is, the Bible, as Jesus said, ye do err not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know the Word of God. 
Bible says in John 15, 7, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So the closer, the more you stay in tune with the Lord and you walk and talk with God, the more you'll know the will of God. The will of God is found in the Word of God. Amen? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible tells us here in verse 11, For our other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation. So the foundation, of course, is representative of salvation. So now that you're saved, you need to build on this. God saved, does the saving of your soul, but you got to do the building in your life. you got to build. you got to add some things. And we did a whole study over there in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. And uh, if you'd like to go back in our, our, um, in our playlist for principles of spiritual growth. And I have a whole series of messages over there in 2 Peter. And he says over there in verse 5 to, to add. Add to your faith. Add to your faith. That's that foundation of Christ in verse 5 of 2 Peter 1. I have a whole series of messages. Go back there. Look at those messages. And... Uh, uh, look at that, to help you grow in the Lord, amen? So anyway, um, he says you need to build some things. You need to add some things. God's not going to do it for you. We think God's going to do everything for us. No, no, no. God has, we got to understand what, what, what is God's part and what's our part, amen? we got to keep those two things straight. Sometimes God's waiting on you to do something. Sometimes you must be waiting on God. So anyway, he says to add some things. You're going to build gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. How? For the day shall declare it. Why? How? Because it shall be revealed by fire. Now we know when you put fire to gold, silver, and precious stones, it abides. But we know that when you put fire to wood, hay, and stubble, poof, gone, burns up. Amen? So God says... The things that you do now that you're saved, after you've received Christ as your Savior, you're either building on this foundation, wood, hay, stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. So you'll find out someday, every one of us, including myself, will find out as believers how we did. It's like, it's like the graduation, so to speak. You'll find out, just like the kids, you know, they're sitting in the audience in the crowds, um, with their parents, and the parents are all excited and hoping and hoping their young boy or their uh, young daughter, young girl will be going to uh, come up on that platform and receive the award, the certificate for having a great year. And then sometimes some parents find out at the end of the whole ceremony that their kids didn't receive anything. Why? Because they wasted their year. I hope that's not the same for you when it comes to now that if you're saved, that you haven't wasted most of your walk with God. That's, that, that would be terrible. God says he wants to give you rewards. He's looking forward to rewarding us. Amen? And the Bible says there, so what's going to happen is what we did for Christ, what we did for the Lord will result in gold, silver, precious stones. What we did for ourselves, what we did uh, without any regard for God, we live for the world, the flesh, and the devil, will result in wood, hay, stubble, and that will all burn up. It'll be like a pile of ashes, so to speak. I hope we have something as believers. You know, you can lose rewards, you can gain rewards. It's a whole study in itself. And then he says this. It's interesting um, verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. You know, I've always thought of this verse in a reverse application. What do you mean? He says there, if any man's work shall be burned. So let's say that someone's work was burnt, all of it. I wonder what kind of life that would have translated into that that person lived. That's a, that's a tough one, isn't it? You know, obviously, that was a waste of a life. You could have done so much more for God. You could have counted for eternity, whatever. You know, a lot of us, we, because we're living in this temporal world, even though if you're saved, you have eternal life, God says, let's not focus on all the temporal things here. Oh, yes, there's some necessities. We've got to fix and repair and 
and eat and we got to, you know, pay the bills and do all these things. It's not that we shouldn't do those, but is all of our focus on things down below here? As Paul wrote to the Colossian believers, how about things above? Things above, amen? Heavenly. Eternal things. Because he said, everything you see here is temporal. Everything. Have you thought about that? Anyway, we know this, that that would result in rewards. So it's important for us, it's important for us that the judgment seat of Christ. He says back in that passage here, let's go back there, uh, in Romans chapter 14, Romans chapter 14. Um, he says there that all believers, if you notice that, the Bible says, so verse 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall, some stand? No, all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, the letter, Paul's letter to Corinthian believers, saved people, will all stand, will all it's judgment. None will be excluded. We shall all stand. That's a promise. Every one of us will stand there. It's a guarantee. God's word is true. The people out there in this world, unsaved people, uh, the mockers, the scoffers out there would like you to think, no, this book's not accurate. And unfortunately, there's even some Christians who deny the literal interpretation of the Bible. They deny the accuracy of the Word of God. And I thank God I have an accurate translation in the King James. Amen. I thank God He's preserved it for us. We have the words of God. You know, that'd be kind of tough. You know, the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone. You remember over there in Luke 4, Matthew 4? But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It'd be important for you to have every word. Not just the message. Not just the message. But the very message words of God. Somebody, oh, that's all that matters is having the main message and the main truths. No, God says he promised to give us every word, and you're supposed to live by every word each and every day. Thank God for that. Amen? So he talks about that. He talks about we shall all stand. Stand, just like you stand and appear before a judge. Amen? Just like Paul stood before Caesar. He was the highest human judge and ruler at his, in his day. And he was a terrible one, Nero, died at the hands of Nero. You know, so your works, our works as believers will be judged. And there God will also not only judge our works, but I believe this, in, um, <coughs> back in that 1 Corinthians 3 passage, go back there again, better remain there for a moment. The Bible says, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Not only is he going to try the works, but you know what? He's going to try the motives. You know, I, I, I tell the parents here at the church here, and it's so important here, you know, go to Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible talks about children obey your parents in the Lord. And sometimes we got to make sure that we understand a very important principle as parents when we're raising our kids. That's ju it's just not enough uh, for us to get our kids to obey. There's a next level that must be added on top of that obedience, and that's this, honor thy father and thy mother. So there's action and there's attitude. What kind of attitude did you have? You know, what was the motive here? What is the reasoning here? Not only should we obey, but do it with a right attitude and a right spirit. And God wants us not to just to do the work of God, but do it with a right attitude and a right spirit. You have a right attitude and a right spirit? You know, God's people, you know, I hope you come to church, and obviously we can't now. This is being re recorded uh, before it takes place. And, you know, I, I Listen, I, I don't know if, if God's people understand how important it is to assemble together. It's a command in the Bible. That command ap applies. It, it transcends time and culture in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. We need to obey that command. And here we are. We're down to five. 
cannot congregate as we ought to. I hope for believers out there, you know, wherever you're watching this, number one, you need to be part of a local New Testament church in your local area and be involved in that as much as you can within the guidelines and the leadership of that church. And, but you ought to... You ought to feel uncomfortable that you cannot meet. That ought to bother you. It shouldn't be the norm. It shouldn't be something, oh, it's, what's the big deal? It should be a big deal to you. You know, it was hard to, to write the things that I wrote concerning the changes that came down this past week. But God wants you to meet together. But God just doesn't want us to come because we're commanded. He wants us to come because we really love him. We love him. He's our Savior. Amen. We have a good spirit about it, a good attitude about it. This is what we need today. This is what we need today. So whatever you do for God, do it with the right attitude and right spirit. If you just go through the motions and just do it, but you, you're, you're, you're angry inside, you're upset inside, you really don't want to do it, but you're just doing it to keep somebody happy, you've lost the reward. Now, let me, let me qualify some. Parents, you got kids, they got a wrong attitude. They ne still need to obey you. They need to obey you. And as they get older, of course, hopefully in time when you, when you uh, make sure that these kids are trained and taught and you've, you've brought them up in the ways of God, that, that, that they'll have the right attitude. They need to have a right attitude. And you need to correct them if they don't have the right attitude. And by the way, delayed obedience is disobedience. We need to obey God today, right now. Whatever it is God's speaking in your heart about, you need to obey God. What is it that you're holding back on? There's something that you know God has told you to do. Maybe one of the reasons why you can't get clear direction on something, because maybe God says, do you remember that thing a while back that you had talked to me about in prayer? If you could just hear the voice of God, he'd probably say this to you. I'm waiting on you to do that. There's something you need to take care of in the past that you've said no to God about. You want God to do something else for you? How dare we do that? Let's get our hearts right and make sure we take care of business with God. Amen? So he says there that it's, it's a sorting process. I used to work in a machine shop years ago in Niagara Falls, and uh, I worked there for 14 years in the QAQC department, and um, I was also involved for maintenance for a, a couple of years. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, a lot of sorting went on back then. I mean, piece by piece sorting, sampling inspection, and so I know all about sorting, good and bad. Accept, reject. wonder if God's going to sort through everything in your life. I wonder what he's going to accept and reject. What he accepts is gold, silver, precious stone. What he rejects is wood, hay, stubble. Can you examine? Do inventory. Spiritual inventory in your life today. See where you're at. You know, we do inventory in so many other areas. Not that we should neglect those. But how about a spiritual inventory? So let's look at another passage on the, uh, on the uh, judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to have to wrap up here in about 10 minutes or so. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's another passage that is dealing with the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There's that good or bad. There's that accept or reject, as I just mentioned in relation to that illustration of, of sorting through product manufacturing. Good, bad, accept, reject. That's what God's going to do. He's going to sort through things in your life. It'd be better for you to sort through them right now. How do you sort through them? Go through the Word of God. 
God will show you what he will accept and reject. And in these questionable matters, I've already given you direction on them. If you're not fully convinced or fully persuaded, stop. Don't do it. Number two, is it, would God be pleased with it? Are you doing it unto the Lord? Number three, how is it going to stand at this judgment seat? If you say it's not going to stand very well, stop. Don't do it. If we could just allow God and the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and lives to help us make these right decisions in life, we would, we would reduce so much heartache in our lives. We would reduce so many negative consequences for bad choices and decisions in our life. Boy, God, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to make the right choices and decisions. He says this in verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade man. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest uh, in your conscience, consciousness. Watch this. Here we go. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Let's look at another place. There's a few places that give little glimpses of this judgment seat of Christ. And Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 22, <clears throat> Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. By the way, you know, some of the things we do in our life, we're doing it because people are watching us. And then when we're away from people, maybe we're all alone. We end up doing some things we know that really God would not be pleased with. We are, I, we are men pleasers. The Bible says when we live that way. How about let's please God? Did you know something? God sees and knows everything. Um, omniscient, omnipresent. Sees and knows everything. So what? You know, we are just fooling ourselves. As I say so many times in our church service, we we focus so much on the horizontal. What is, what's the horizontal? It's people that we see: our family, our spouse, our children, our parents. Our, our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church house, wherever, our neighbors. You know, we're just looking to see if they're looking. And if they're looking, we act one way. When they're not looking, we act a totally a different way. No, no, no. We ought to be consistent for the Lord. Amen? We ought to look up. Look vertically. Not just horizontally. Always look up. Look up. God. This please God. God sees everything I'm doing. God sees my, my, my browser history before I erase it. God sees every place I've gone. God seems has has God has seen all the places on the internet with a tablet, cell phone, computer. He knows. He knows the things that we've looked at that we ought not to look at. And we need to examine our own hearts. He says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 20 uh and whatsoever ye do, verse 23, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. So we need to put our heart into it, and we need to do it unto God. Then he says, knowing that, O Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord in Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there hath no respect to person. So God doesn't say, I, you know, I, I'm going to treat you a little bit. The, the judgment process, the judgment seat of Christ will be a little different for you versus no, it's all the same for everybody. And basically what he's going to do is going to sort out everything we've done in our life. And we're either going to receive reward or lack thereof. It'll go up in, in flames and smoke. Then we'll just read this here, and we've got to wrap up shortly here. Go back to Romans 14. Romans 14 and verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You know, God's one of these gods that he, he keeps track of things. He's a great accountant. And he's keeping track of our lives. He's very accurate at it, and it, his records are perfect. He's got the true record. You know, the records we keep are not always accurate. That's why we got to do reconciliations with the bank to make sure that, wait a minute, is there an error on my end or on the bank's end? We're always trying to compare to some kind of standard or 
Is, is it right or wrong? Is it accurate? Well, God's records are perfect. And he says, we're going to, every one of us are going to have to give an account of ourselves to God. Now, that can extend in the sense of a husband, because the Bible has appointed him in this position to be the ruler of the home. People don't like that. But the Bible teaches that. You'll be accountable. Even as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made a decision for his wife and kids. He didn't take a vote. He didn't see where everybody felt, how everybody felt about it. He just made a decision, a right decision. He says, as far as myself and my family, we're going to serve God. That's our course. That's our decision. Um, so God is, I will be accountable to God as a husband. I will be accountable, accountable to God as a father. I'll be accountable to God as a shepherd of this flock here at New Testament Baptist Church in Halifax. I'm going to have to give an account. We're going to do a lot of accounting someday. We're going to find out how we did, where we wasted time, talents, and treasures in our personal life and other areas of our life. Um, he says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and so then every one of us, every one of us, notice the emphasis upon Every one of us, there's no way to escape this judgment seat of Christ. And again, it's for reward or lack of it. We shall all, you'll see that in verse 10. Every knee, verse 11. Every tongue, verse 11. Every one of us, verse 12. Wow. Personal accountability. Personal accountability. Every believer will stand before God as an individual. So let's, let's wrap up here. Before you start looking at somebody else and say, well, I know a Christian over there. They're not really doing the, this thing. And, you know, the pastor told me, well, listen, first, let's get past the pastor told me. I'm not saying the pastor told you wrong, but make sure that you understand from the Bible what the Bible says. Because really, the pastors should be a messenger of God, preaching the words of God. So it's, it, the issue really is the words of God. The Bible says you're going to answer to God. So you say, someone else is not doing what they should be doing according to the Scriptures. Well, that doesn't relieve you of your responsibility. We must obey God. We must obey God. We need to obey God. Let's get our eyes off everybody else and say, well, so-and-so in this church and this group and that group and this one, and I saw this on YouTube or I saw this on uh, Instagram or in Facebook or whatever, and I saw these Christians, they're, do they're doing this, so it must be okay. No, it isn't necessarily. It's, that's not the basis for what's right and wrong. The basis for what's right and wrong is the Bible. It's God's holy word. So we've got to get our eyes off everybody else and stop doing that comparison game because the Bible even tells us over there, and I'll read that passage to you, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, and I'll just we'll have to wrap up with this. Um, For we dare not make ourselves as, a, as, as of, of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. But they measuring themselves by themselves, comparing themselves among themselves, here it is, are not wise. The standard is not another believer. The standard is God. What does God say? What does the Bible say? And that's how God's going to judge everything. That's how God's going to do everything. So, number one, a couple of weeks ago, are you fully persuaded or are you fully convinced? These are disputable, you know, doubtful disputations. We're not too sure about some of these things. They're not clearly outlined in Scripture as far as exactly thou shalt, thou shalt not. So you've got to make some decisions. God's given you a brain. God's given you a heart. Search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Amen? And you still can't find? Here's, here's, here's the process you need to go through. Are you fully persuaded? Or is there a little shadow, just a shadow of doubt there? Number two, can you do it unto the Lord? Would God be pleased? Would he, would he receive it? Would he accept that? Is he pleased with that? Number three, how is it going to stand? The test at the judgment seat of Christ. Those are three good questions. Well, Lord willing, we'll pick it up. we got three more to ask. <clears throat> and they're all found in Romans chapter 14 and the beginning of Romans 15. So God bless you, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning. And Lord willing, we hope to connect with you again. Let's pray. Father, thank you again.
for your word. Now bless, Lord God, meet with each and every need to pray the Holy Spirit of God would take the words, your words, Lord, not mine, your words, and work in the hearts and lives of people. Pray for those who are lost. Help them to open their eyes, their hearts to you, Lord. Pray for believers. Help us to ask these questions, Lord. Help us to be, Lord God, honest with ourselves and ask these questions of ourselves. And guide and direct our lives. Give us clear direction, Lord God. God, move. And God, during these times that we're living in, help your people not to be full of fear. Help your people, Lord God, to reach out to people. Reach out, giving the gospel. Reach out to brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord God, we need to encourage each other at this time. Help us to go outside our comfort zone, Lord. We need your help. We need your strength. Now, bless, Lord God, and we'll thank you and praise you, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.